So I redid my bioactive California king snake enclosure and I set myself a challenge. The challenge was is to do this as cheap as possible but as good as possible and actually stay in line with the theme of the California biotope that I had in mind. Now I'm going to be using weeds as proxies that are in California. So let's go through my enclosure and let me show you what I've done. The thing that I have not told you though is that there's a very special set of custodians in this enclosure. And that is the blue death feigning beetle hailing from the same region as the California king snake. So this is one of my blue death feigning beetles. Now these are incredibly good at consuming feces. Now they actually are quite gregarious and they like a high protein diet. So they are excellent candidates for cleaning up feces. And this particular invertebrate is something that I've been working with anyway. So I placed them in this enclosure for them to actually hopefully breed because they are very, very rarely bred in captivity. There's a few people that I know in the States that have bred this in captivity and I could not name you a single person in the UK that I know that has bred them. So I'm hoping that with this large environment with many choices and thermal gradients and UV and, and humidity gradients that I'm hoping they will breed in here. So I think if we start from left to right this here is broadleaf plantain. Now obviously this species is not the exact same species as the one that hails from California. But the Californian species is pretty much identical to the average hobbyist anyway. I'm sure a botanist would disagree with that. But it's the same genus. Um, it's going to perform the exact same role as if I like imported seeds from the US. So this is acting as a proxy for the species of broadleaf plantain that would be in the exact same region as the California king snake in their wild habitat. Now I took this from the edge of a path near my house. It was in quite a dusty, um, low quality soil environment. And these are known for being incredibly hardy. So I thought it would be an excellent candidate for this sort of arid setup like this. And what actually happened was, is that it kind of melted away for like the first week or so after I put it in. But after then, all those brown leaves were eaten by the cleanup crew and all these fresh green shoots came through. And now this plant is doing really, really well. And it's really important that I have something like this that can withstand these temperatures so that the actual nitrogen cycle is taking place in this hot end. That was my main concern that I wouldn't have anything doing so well on this warm end. I know I was talking about plants, but I just want to interrupt to show you this. There's a wolf spider basking under the UV on that plant. So he's directly under the UV, basking. So one of my main concerns for this setup was actually an overabundance of custodians. What I've had previously is I had so many mealworms and so many ice pods that they were actually irritating the snake. So one thing that I've thought of is to try and mitigate that irritation on the snake is to have sort of predators in the enclosure. So I would imagine very young isopods will be taken by the spider. Mealworms especially I'd imagine will be taken by the spider. And there are other things in there that um, I'm sure that spider won't say no to. So. I, I, I physically put him in there myself and he's the only one in there. So I'll see how it goes. I don't particularly want a million spiders in there. But for a wandering spider that doesn't produce webs, I don't mind it because it's not going to put cobwebs everywhere. The aloe vera is a species that was already in there. And you can find that on iNaturalist in California. So that's why it's included. Now a similar story, like I need to be careful of Charlie here. Charlie is trying to sneak up on me to nibble a finger. 
So over here we have we have dandelion again same story as the broadleaf plantain this is acting as a proxy for the species of dandelion that's in california same genus looks exactly the same to me um, and obviously it's going to perform the same role and i did actually experiment with planting some grass as well as more broadleaf plantain over there i took a clump of grass from my garden um, from a sandy area where i anticipated there to be not very many ants and I plugged it in there and it's doing very well and I have to move back now because this little one was sneaking up on my wrist there and he will take a chomp if he wants to and there are some plants in here that have just cropped up that I have no idea what they are so like this little thing down here I don't know what that is but I will let that grow um, until it's something that I think may be a nuisance and then I'll deal with it but for now it's, help, it's helping with the nitrogen cycle and the actual functioning of the soil, so I'll leave it where it is for now. The good thing with naturalistic and bioactive arid setups is that you want a grassy look, just chuck some grass in there. If it doesn't grow, it doesn't grow. Even when it's dead, it looks good. And that, is, that kind of is the beauty of arid, really. If you look over here, look, it just looks good. The thing that I want to get across is no, you don't have to buy house plants or plants from a specialist supplier. You can go out and get weeds. Now, what you should do is be very, very careful of where you live and know who's using pesticides. Are there wild reptiles in your area? Is there a disease risk of your collection? For me, my risk level is extremely low. There's no reptiles in my area. The fragmentation of, of reptile populations in the UK, sadly, is a benefit in this scenario. Not that I would choose that, but you, you see what I mean. 